Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of Ted Kaczynski. In this video, we will examine his short essay, Morality and Revolution, which, as the title suggests, deals with providing a serious response to the question of whether a revolution against modern technology might be immoral on grounds that it will inevitably have to involve a lot of things which will seem objectionable or perhaps even contrary to one's hardwired sense of right and wrong, or whether, on the other hand, a revolution against modern technology might be the only thing which one will have to do in order to remain consistent with one's own hardwired intuitions of morality. This is a part of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Link to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. I'd also like to mention that if you find this discussion interesting, you may want to check out my 2019 book, The Philosophy of Ted Kuczynski, my 2022 book, Leftoid Psychology, and my upcoming book, Technological Crisis, A Reader's Guide to the Unabomber Manifesto of Ted Kuczynski. We also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories, but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. So as we get into the text itself, we find that according to the Feral House edition of Technological Slavery, um, in which this essay is included, this was written in 1999 and was originally published in Green Anarchist. So even before reading the essay, we are already confronted with a certain tension between the notions of anarchy and morality, which in popular opinion would seem to be mutually exclusive terms, in that um, somebody who disregards the laws of society in the formal political sense of the term would seem to be just as opposed to abiding by any personal moral laws. Well, Kaczynski's stance with regard to anarchy is complicated in the biographical sense that he did eventually distance himself from the anarchist label, such as in a 2015 letter from prison which I reference in my book, The Philosophy of Ted Kaczynski. But there is evidence that he identified himself with that term to some extent in the pre-arrest era, and uh, despite significant disagreements, he maintained contact with figures within the green anarchist movement, such, such as John Zerzon, as late as the early post-arrest years. But while it is clear that Kaczynski once considered himself an anarchist, he never considered himself an amoralist, despite the irony that for decades now he has been known in the public imagination for nothing except the stereotype of being quote-unquote just a violent criminal. Although his philosophical works continue to grow in popularity due to, say, their intellectual rigor or their relevance to the very real technological problems confronting our future, very few people to the present day have any idea that the so-called Unabomber was also an anti-technological philosopher. It's because the media has succeeded so well in eclipsing his monumental body of work with the simplistic caricatured label of a quote-unquote unrepentant serial killer, effectively painting him with the same broad brush of guilt by association as an actual sociopathic serial rapist like Ted Bundy would deserve to have done to him. But whereas the general public might lump these two concepts of anarchy and amoralism together, in many ways we can think of this essay as a challenge to the popular belief that these are the same thing. We might assume that the two could be so easily confused for one another because somebody who dismisses the formal governing structures of, say, the laws of the state would seem to be the same kind of person who would abuse one's liberation from those restrictions simply as a means to an end, to take whatever they want, whenever they want it. But the grand irony which Kaczynski reveals in this essay is that the ideal scenario would be one in which one could have morality without having to rely on any formal governing structure to coerce one to act ethically. There are very good reasons, in fact, to argue that this is the only way that morality really could exist. Because the alternative in which morality eventually comes to be fully controlled by the system. Well, that is a situation in which morality will inevitably devolve into nothing more than an instrument which the system will use to control us by playing what might as well be called the system's second neatest trick, much like the system's neatest trick described in an essay within the same collection. The system's second neatest trick 
um, induces us to obey a certain kind of moral code, but one that is favored by the system only because it furthers the interests of technological advancement, even while maintaining the illusion of promoting timeless and objectively true moral values. Any confusion between these polar opposite scenarios, both of which claim to be founded on morality, really hinges on a certain equivocation which Kaczynski clarifies through explicitly contrasting what he calls conventional morality, which is only ever belatedly imposed on a person through the over-socialization of, say, education or religious indoctrination or law, uh, versus a natural morality, as he calls it, which one arrives at simply through following one's own hardwired conscience. This distinction between natural morality and conventional morality therefore reiterates the same distinction between nature and technology that runs through the rest of his works. Just as there is no such thing as the power process in the abstract, for it must either be uh, construed naturally, in which case it'll be called freedom, or artificially, in which case it'll be called a surrogate activity, so too there really is no such thing for Kaczynski as morality in the abstract. For any real concrete instantiation of it must either be constru uh, construed through nature or through technology. Another similarity between natural morality and the desire for power, which underlies the power process, is that Kaczynski uses almost exactly the same terminology when he speculates that both are quote-unquote probably based in biology, which is just another way of saying that both are instinctual and therefore can only function properly if modern technology does not interfere with them. Even in the absence of modern technology, though, Kaczynski considered the conventional morality of pre-modern civilization or dogmatic religion to be anti-natural in the sense that this sort of morality only works if it represses one's hardwired instincts by forcing one to adopt so many strict and predetermined behaviors which are mandated in advance by a set of clear and explicit laws which are meant to control how one should act in a given situation rather than allow one the opportunity to work through what might be called the morality process in which case one will have to exert effort to reason through what the best course of action might be given the circumstances. Another way of putting this is that whereas natural morality requires human choice, conventional morality has to negate human choice. But something far more important than human choice in, say, the consumerist sense of the term is at stake here. For the real point, I think, which Kaczynski tries to drive home in this essay is his warning that anyone who finds it easy to condemn the crimes of the Unabomber on grounds that they were quote-unquote obviously or blatantly immoral, will miss the deeper point that he allegedly only did what he did as a desperate attempt to try to save the earth from the single most immoral thing which ever could happen to it, which is the extinction of not only humans but of all complex life as a result of extreme ecological devastation. What this really means, though, is that the latter scenario is completely unnatural, in the sense that even the most hardened human criminal in history would never opt for it because it so thoroughly violates one's intuition of natural morality. The global technological system, in contrast, is hardwired to have to choose this apocalyptic outcome because continued technological advancement really leaves no other option except a world which is so ecologically damaged that life itself will eventually become impossible. The global technological system can so easily do that which no human criminal could ever bring himself or herself to contemplate precisely because the technological system is no person at all, but is in its purest form a rational system teleologically oriented towards maximizing its own efficiency, productivity, and predictability. As Jacques Ellul noted in his classic The Technological Society, this is secondarily instantiated in a set of so many physical machines, but technology's purely abstract and rational nature is exactly what makes it something which could never be constrained by any human ideal of good 
or evil, even if it may do a very good job in the short term of pulling off the illusion that it exists for the sole purpose of actualizing the good within history. If you need proof of this, just look at how the woke clowns within Hollywood and the music industry are at this point just openly saying that you should give them more money, despite the fact that they don't actually produce any art anymore. This is all done with the tacit agreement that art simply isn't important enough anymore because propaganda which directly actualizes the moral good in the form of the SJW movement within human history is the only thing which is really worthy of the attention of the wealthy elites who supposedly run this society. Now if we now move on to examining the text itself, um, we find that Kaczynski opens by noting that while it is true that conventional morality is something which is used to enslave people, which his audience of anarchist readers would surely agree with, that does not mean that morality itself does not exist in some natural sense. To prove this, Kaczynski has the reader imagine a few scenarios which are so disturbingly immoral that even the most um, ardent anarchist would find them not only objectionable, but would even likely intervene to stop them from happening. For example, one could consider a scenario in which an elderly woman is knocked down and kicked for no reason except that someone happens to find the way she looks annoying. Or imagine a pervert who has a quote-unquote thing for little girls and then proceeds to rape a four-year-old kid on grounds that the laws against child molestation were founded in a political structure which is bogus. Well, even avowed anarchists would not only find these acts reprehensible, but once again would likely intervene to stop them from being carried out if they saw them occurring in their proximity. This aversion to beating up old ladies or sexually abusing little girls cannot be attributed to any formal education or any culturally specific socialization, for they are present in all cultures, and must instead be thought of as evidencing the presence of a certain hardwired sense of morality, in much the same way that the need for power is a universal across all human cultures and all historical eras. Once again, it is not a coincidence that Kaczynski uses the term biologically predisposed in this essay, in much the same way that he uses the term probably based in biology to describe the origin of the power process in paragraph 33 of the Unabomber Manifesto. Well, one major difference between this biologically predisposed natural morality and the conventional morality of law, religion, or education is that whereas the conventional morality consists of a numerically huge set of different specific commands which are meant to predetermine how one should act in virtually any given situation, the natural morality is, comparatively, extremely simple. Although it can be thought of as six basic principles, all of these represent the same intuition of a certain hardwired conception of fairness, as he calls it, which it operates in the background in all of our moral decision making. Now, if we quote directly from the text, the six principles are as follows. Number one, do not harm anyone who has not previously harmed you or threatened to do so. Number two, the principle of self-defense and retaliation. You can harm others in order to forestall harm with which they threaten you or in retaliation for harm that they have already inflicted on you. Number three, one good turn deserves another. If someone has done you a favor, you should be willing to do her or him a comparable favor if and when he or she should need one. Number four, the strong should have consideration for the weak. Number five, do not lie. Number six, abide faithfully by any promises or agreements that you make. He warns the reader that these six principles of fairness really do not make up a moral code in the proper sense of the term. Because whereas a moral code has to be perfectly clear, these six principles of fairness are inherently ambiguous and can only be implemented if the subject exerts effort to make a decision on how they are to be applied in a specific real-life situation. In contrast, society's moral codes are constantly tending away from ambiguity by strictly mandating how exactly one should act in any given situation. 
In fact, Kaczynski interprets the mandate against violence in modernity to be nothing more than a very subtle way of saying that you are no longer to act on the second principle of natural morality itself, which, as you may recall, is the principle that one has to retaliate for harm done to oneself. We tolerate this suspension of the second principle of natural morality not on grounds that there will be no retaliation at all, but rather with the understanding that this will be outsourced to the government. Even today, though, it is noted that the idea that one should just rely on the police to help when if one has a dispute is really an American way of thinking, as in Russian culture, one allegedly tends to rely on one's family for help in such situations because the police there allegedly don't understand it to be their job to resolve your petty disagreements. Similarly, in the Godfather novel, one character emigrates from Italy to America and naively trusts the legal system there to provide justice after his daughter is sexually harassed by two young men, only to find them let off the hook because one of them happened to be the son of a well-connected politician. When he is forced to go to the mafia godfather Vito Corleone for help, Corleone asks him why he didn't just come to him for help in the first place, on grounds that only a fool would be so confident that the American legal system wouldn't be rigged to serve the interests of the rich and powerful. Well, interestingly, in this context, the notorious New York Mafia actually does hold the moral high ground over the corrupt New York legal system. Beyond the realm of fiction, though, we find the recent real-life example of the FBI's attempts to harshly persecute the people who acknowledge the existence of the Bunter Hyden laptop as agents of misinformation, while refusing to do anything about the real crimes associated with the laptop itself, in a strange reversal of justice into its exact opposite, which proves Kaczynski's point here all too well. To return to the essay, Kaczynski notes that one is only really using the principles of natural morality if one has the freedom to decide both how to implement them and how not to implement them, or how to make exceptions in justified cases for the sake of avoiding an even greater evil that would result from robotically adhering to a generic rule that really does not cover the present case. One might perhaps interpret Kaczynski's own life story to be an all-too-memorable instance of the latter, though this is admittedly only speculation on my part. Anarchy is therefore very specifically defined as seizing the right to always interpret for oneself how to implement the six principles concretely, on grounds that any governmental structure which tried to do that for you would be supplementary to your ability to do so at best, and would destroy your ability to do so at worst. There are reasons to think, though, that natural and conventional morality forms something more like a smooth continuum leading from one to the other, rather than a strict binary of intrinsically separated terms, in that Kaczynski suggests that societies already begin to fall into a somewhat conventional rather than totally natural morality as soon as just two people have to coexist with one another. As he says himself in this essay, only the hermit is really free because as soon as you get another person in the room, there are bound to be disagreements over the interpretation of right and wrong. This is what you should expect though because inherently ambiguous moral principles will inevitably come to be interpreted slightly differently by each person. The reason why each person will perform perform the hermeneutical procedure slightly differently is precisely that in the absence of excessively over-technologized conditions, this will have to be done with freedom. One might be reminded of Jacques Ellul's claim in the second chapter of the Technological Society that in pre-modern times, tools were used slightly differently by different people because it was understood that the hardwired imperfections within the tool were to be compensated for by the skill of the human worker because that skill was implemented in accord with that person's natural freedom. Personal variations in the use of the tool basically expressed a visual manif manifestation of an unpredictable and not yet fully technologized excess of human nature itself. This was one reason why pre-modern technique never developed the kind of systematic uniformity across huge geographical spheres of influence which we take for granted today. For that is only possible if the worker shrinks down to the status of a passive machine operator whose only role is to push a button to launch an almost fully automated process into execution.
So too in the moral realm, disagreements over the interpretation of right and wrong, evidence of the existence of human subjectivity in the precise sense of a kind of freedom which is slowly eroded as natural morality comes to be transformed over time into an ever more conventional morality. The reason why this happens is clear. As societies grow in size and complexity, they have no choice except to develop predetermined laws in order to reduce the inherent ambiguity of natural morality and its six principles by providing explicit rules which restrict behavior in more precise ways, to use Kaczynski's own phrase, than the six principles on their own ever could do. This eventually reaches the point, however, of making subjective interpretation of the principles impossible. As modern technology is teleologically oriented towards transforming humans into the kind of robots who can be expected to do exactly what the system as a whole requires of each of its parts, simply because the very possibility of freedom will have to be blotted out for each cog in order for it to function properly within the pseudo-ecosystem of so many the other machines. Both in the Unabomber Manifesto and also in his 1971 unpublished essay, Progress versus Liberty, Kaczynski was very careful to note that the excessive regulation of modern technological society cannot be attributed to any humanistic cause of, say, willful malice or mean-spiritedness. In Progress versus Liberty, he explained the reason for this inverse relation between technological advancement and freedom as follows. Newer technologies have to be regulated because they're intrinsically more powerful than their predecessors. You can just compare the power of a car, truck, or Hummer to that of a donkey cart or horse-drawn carriage to see this very clearly. But it's not just their increased power on an individual level as machines. Regulation is necessary also because each fills the role of a smaller part within a broader inter interconnected system. In which case, the system itself has no choice except to coerce each element to do its job correctly. The point of cars is not just that they have more horsepower, quite literally, than a horse-drawn carriage would, but also that their movements occur within a gargantuan network of highways and must therefore be coordinated in nearly perfect unison with thousands of other cars on the road in order to prevent accidents from occurring at a higher rate than they already do. The end result of this can only be the fully predictable phenomenon of self-driving cars, for which it will no longer be enough to use over-socialization to psychologically condition human drivers to do what they're supposed to on the road. Instead, the computer's electronic brain will do that for you by eventually driving all of the cars in the world simultaneously from the same one command center. In a strange materialist instantiation of the underlying logic which had only been implicitly and abstractly at work before, that of a single system of perfectly coordinated elements, for which the movement of each piece had always already been predetermined by the rationalized needs of the whole. Nearly 30 years later, in his 1999 Morality and Revolution, Kaczynski similarly warned, quote-unquote, in technologically advanced societies, the social mechanism is complex and rigid and can function only when human behavior is closely regulated. The really scary thing about this shift in emphasis to morality is that this proves that for the global technological system, it's not just cars, but all of the humans in the global population, which will eventually have to be driven in units and from the same one command ancestor, not only to prevent deadly road accidents, as might have been the justification for self-driving cars, but also to prevent any undesired behavior whatsoever. The irony is that morality will become impossible precisely if the technological system succeeds in forcing all of us to act only in those ways which would seem on a superficial level to be perfectly moral. For morality here really refers to the kind of freedom which only nature provides the conditions for, rather than refer to any easily identifiable prescription for behavior. Only this fine distinction of terms can help us to see why the permissiveness of modern society, which is still occasionally condemned by old-fashioned moralists of, say, the conservative religious variety, paradoxically indicates a greater rather than lesser degree of conventional morality 
in our society. Yes, you heard that right. Modern society's extreme permissiveness with regard to sex, drugs, and other forms of pleasure-seeking does not indicate a breakdown in morality, as you might assume, but instead a severe tightening of moralistic controls over our behavior. This paradox was exemplified uniquely well in the scandal of CNN's Jeffrey Tubin, who was fired from the network in late 2020 after being caught self-pleasuring on camera during a Zoom meeting. What had obviously been a multiple times per day ritual during the months-long stretch of pretending to work from home had only been caught that one time because, in his eagerness to get paid to masturbate, he forgot just once to turn off his webcam or microphone before launching into yet another jerk-off session. While CNN's initial reaction was to fire him for committing a uniquely embarrassing blunder in a digital age when the whole world could see the evidence for themselves online, less than one year later, it was announced that Tubin had been brought back to CNN, just as several employees were fired for daring to make their own medical choices by opting out of raising Pfizer's profits by just a few more doses. In this coincidence of events, which were not coincidental at all, CNN made perfectly clear to the world that in the year 2021, refusing to fork over more money to one of the world's wealthiest biotechnology corporations is an unforgivable violation of the conventional morality. Well, demanding to get paid to self-pleasure at work is, in fact, what any normal person should be expected to do. One particularly forward-thinking corporation turned this into a literal company policy after it introduced a new daily 30-minute jerk-off break into the workday, in which public masturbation was cleanly transformed from one of the most humorous stereotypical signs of insanity into a daily ritual which any good corporate employee would have to flaunt before their co-workers just to prove how normal and progressive they are, provided they could catch the other's attention before their own pants came unzipped and their own palms got lubricated with Vaseline. Virtually no one realized, however, that this extreme permissiveness in the realm of sexual perversion did not signal a total breakdown of morality, but instead an even more suffocatingly restricting increase in conventional Moralism. Another closely related example, also from the year 2021, demonstrates this just as well. Near the end of that year, it was reported that one brothel in Austria had engineered the perfect solution to get 100% of the population jabbed with Pfizer's products when it announced that it would offer free sex with the prostitute of one's choice to anyone willing to get penetrated on site themselves by the pharmaceutical industry's magic phallus. Once again, the grand irony is that in this context, anyone who refused to accept both the free sex with the hooker and the jab from Pfizer would be publicly condemned as guilty of immoral behavior, as the higher cause of raising Pfizer's profits provided a pseudo-mystical stamp of absolution which transformed yesterday's sin into today's virtue. It's up to the reader, however, to decide which of the two was really getting screwed in this situation. In Morality and Revolution, Kaczynski noted that modern society's extreme permissiveness in sex, in which you can now sleep with pretty much anyone you want, as well as dress, in which you can adjust your appearance in superficially rebellious ways, etc., are directly proportionate to technology's ever greater control over our behavior in those areas that really matter, such as the production of food or the securing of potable water sources. He identified two reasons why the system tolerates superficially rebellious behavior while making an actual rebellion against its control of society impossible. Creating shocking art, to use his own example, is actually useful to the system because it provides its inmates with an output for the kind of rebellious impulses which they subjectively feel as a result of living under historically unprecedented conditions which contradict hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution as hunter-gatherers. But it channels these negative energies into a harmless domain which, for all of its supposed shock value, leaves the underlying technological rationalization of society completely unchanged. In addition, hedonistic overindulgence in junk food or sexual pleasures provide useful distractions which help one to forget one's loss of freedom under modern technology. 
In this case, we realize that the really fanatical moralists, or the people who make up other people's minds for them by imposing their own strict morals on other people's behavior instead of allowing them to exercise their freedom to interpret a situation on their own, are not religious traditionalists, but are instead the SJWs and wealthy liberal elites who, once again, ironically make society more rigidly moralistic in their supposed challenge to the morals of yesteryear. Kaczynski notes, though, that this imposition of one's morals on other people is itself always done as a desperate attempt to regain the same freedom one tries to take away from the other, because whatever excuse might be given for this behavior, one's real motive is always just an attempt to satisfy one's psychological need for power. Moral policing is then just another surrogate activity, which is not the outcome of any quote-unquote rational program for improving the lot of the human race, but is instead driven by an unconscious desire to return to the natural conditions in which freedom was still possible. It is also important to note that the same word can mean something very different depending on whether its underlying context is natural or technological, in which case it will be moral in the first but not in the second. Kaczynski's own example is the term property. One anthropologist reported that even African Bushmen have some notion of property in that they work out a system for dividing up foraging spaces in order to avoid conflict while also assuring that everybody gets enough to survive. Under modern technology, however, the term property does not mean a fair system designed to help people avoid unnecessary arguments by making sure that everybody gets what they need to survive. Instead, property becomes a highly abstract system of coercion in which a few major corporations are allowed to rig the system to take control of disproportionate shares of the world's natural resources simply as a means to an end to control the population. Whereas property is moral when construed through nature, this control of pro private property through technology is not morality at all, but is instead its opposite. But even more than serving our pathological human drives, the main function of conventional morality is to advance the interests of the global technological system. Here's how this is accomplished. Ironically, it does something like the system's second neatest trick by playing on humans' self-interest to advance its own self-interest. Consider, for example, how the wealthy who profit from current private property laws only defend them so enthusiastically because these same laws allow them to keep a disproportionately large share of the world's resources by using the full power of the state to defend their interests in the guise of upholding a universally moral value called freedom. If the private property laws did not happen to benefit their self-interest as much, clearly they would not be nearly as enthusiastic about promoting them. But it's not just a given wealthy individual's private property, but rather the stability of the system as a whole, which benefits from these same laws. Those with high-ranking positions have an interest in seeing to it that the kind of values which ensure maximum order, stability, and predictability within the whole be promoted to all of the individuals within it through the typical over-socialization channels like educational institutions, the media, etc., once again, the trick here is that the same word might mean two very different things depending on whether it is being construed in a context of natural morality or conventional morality. To use Kaczynski's own example, respecting people regardless of their ethnic background is indeed a natural moral value in line with one's hardwired principles of fairness. But that's not the reason why the system tirelessly promotes racial and um, gender and sexual orientation tolerance. It does so because this makes it much easier for everyone without exception to be incorporated as workers and consumers into the same technological system, which will eventually blot out all personal identifiers as irrelevant in a system in which everybody should ideally be a carbon copy of the same generic cog. Nonviolence, however, makes up a uniquely important example here. It is easy to take for granted today that all violence whatsoever has always been automatically understood to be wrong, simply in accord with one's hardwired intuition of morality. But centuries ago, in the right context, violence was actually admired. If you doubt this, you might be reminded that the noblest caste in pre-modern Europe was the warrior caste, and this was precisely because they had to engage in the real violence of hand-to-hand -hand 
combat in battle. Today, however, violence is the only remaining sin, in that even secular postmodernists, who explicitly deny the existence of any supernatural force whatsoever, tend to make one exception when it comes to violence, by casting it in the same mystical aura of diabolical sinfulness which they would otherwise ridicule. The real reason why violence is condemned as the single worst human behavior today is because from the standpoint of technology, it is the single biggest problem which could arise, because it represents the single most unpredictable act in a system that demands maximum predictability among all of its members. Whatever the professed goal of nonviolence campaigns might be, Kaczynski warns that the real goal is just to turn all of us into human machines who can be counted on to do exactly what we are prescribed to do in every situation. Once again, the irony is that morality will become impossible, precisely if our every act conforms to morality in this perverse sense. Likewise, it is true on one hand that a hypothetical revolution against the technological system will have to involve many things which people would find morally objectionable, perhaps even in line with their hardwired intuitions of natural morality and fairness. But this would all be done, Kaczynski tells us, for the sake of preventing an incomparably greater evil and in fact, a greater evil than ever has existed before. Saying that violence was only acceptable that one time to fight Germany, Italy, and Japan in World War II, as the system usually says, misses the point that all three of these nations were just committing the same sort of evils that had been present for all of human history, Kaczynski tells us, albeit on a much larger scale, though on a still smaller scale than the communists in China and Russia were guilty of. But the evil committed by the technological system is categorically different. That evil will lead to a kind of ecological destruction that may very well end up making conflict's life itself impossible in the future. Not only for humans, but for all things, except perhaps some types of algae, bacteria, etc. The irony is that those who comply perfectly with the conventional morality are therefore unwittingly cooperating in slowly actualizing the single most immoral event in human history. Something which one should bear in mind before claiming to seize the moral high ground when demanding all of Kaczynski's work to be thrown in the fire on grounds that he was, quote-unquote, a violent criminal.